Alrighty. So, we know that the entire smorgasbord of problems that have been happening uh, with the Supreme Court, a lot of this became knowledge to us because of the leaked Justice Alito opinion. Uh, but there's a lot more that could be going on there. And there's an opinion piece on the New York Times that I wanted to read uh, called Alito's Calls to Secure Religious Liberty. I want to take a look at it and uh, we'll, we'll develop some opinions on it as we go. This one is from Green Tea Skittle. Said, I did a thing. Okay, um, I have a problem. And that problem is that I I think this needs to be an outfit. I I want this to be an outfit. It doesn't even have to be on Slime Girl Service. Did I just want this outfit? This is amazing. This is adorable. And I'm copying the image. And I'm sending it to Suzu and Remixen because they are the ones I have to throw money at for this. Salem as well, actually, if that is a thing that uh, that Salem has time for. But anyways, this this piece is awesome. I I actually really really like it. So as we'll go to debt for the cat girl, don't tell them that, Fana. It's true though. Anyways, next one we have here is from Kidderdoodle said Bon Bon and Raz being gay with. Uh, octopuses, uh, oct octopus, uh, emojis with rainbows that, yep, yep, yep. To, to clarify, Bon Bon and Raz are not dating, uh, but they were doing, uh, double takeover on the subathon a couple of times when I had AFK. So those memes came from that. The next one we have here is from Mr. Stoffelees. Uh, it is not the first piece of fan art I've regretted coming from Stoff said, hi, I'm here to cause problems and shitpost crack ship art. So from when me and Vice Rhino did our collaboration, Blizzy ships it too. Bah. Smacko says, subathon for nonstop commissioning. I'm 100% unbiased in this, of course. Yes, Smacko, as an artist whom I have paid United States dollars to, uh, you definitely are unbiased in this particular scenario. Uh-huh. Don't, don't even, don't even at me. As always, thank you all for your fan art submissions. If you want your fan art to be shown in a future video, the best way to do so is to drop it into the fan art section of the Discord. With that said, if you haven't subscribed already or hit the uh, bell notification icon or even checked out the Patreon, maybe consider doing all of those things to help out the channel a feck ton. Uh, Mui Shui says, please don't remind me of the Vice Rhino fan art. Yeah, I don't want to be reminded of that either. I, I don't. I, I don't. There is there is Pernia, who makes safe fan art with me and Vice Rhino, and there is Stoff, that makes cursed fan art. Two very different angles of attack. As always, though, it's time to go ahead and get into the actual piece itself, now that I have disparaged my mods. Alito's call to secure religious liberty, which would sound perfectly reasonable on its own, but let's see what we have here. Barely a month after handing down the majority opinion that erased the right to abortion, Justice Samuel Alito traveled to Rome to give a keynote address at a religious liberty summit, convened by the Religious Liberty Initiative of the Universe of Notre Dame's Law School. As the video that Notre Dame posted of the bearded justice delivering his remarks made clear, this was a victory lap. I don't like that that's the case. Like, I would think that our justices should be apolitical enough uh, that they wouldn't be doing a victory lap after taking away our uh, our freedoms. But, you know, that's living in a world that we don't live in. The press coverage of that speech last month mainly focused on his snarky comments about world leaders who had the uh, effrontery to criticize what the Supreme Court had done in Dobbs versus Jackson Women Health Organiza Women's Health Organization. One of these was a former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, but he paid the price. Justice Alito deadpanned as laughter filled the majestic Galleria Col uh, Colonna. Is, is that what happened with Boris Johnson? I'm pretty sure there were a sea of issues 
with him in office that just eventually caught up to him. And circumstance made it actually coalesce the way it did. But okay, the self-aggrandizement of saying that, look at what happened to Boris, I did that. One can debate the degree of bad taste displayed by such a remark, but that's not my concern. What interests me about this talk was its substance, a call to arms on behalf of religion. The challenge for those who want to protect religious liberty in the United States, Europe, and other similar places, Justice Alito said, is to convince people who are not religious that religious liberty is worth special protection. On one level, there's nothing surprising about such a declaration from Justice Alito. We know where he stands on religion. He is the author of a long string of opinions that have elevated the free exercise of religion above civil society's other values, including the right to be discriminated against and the right to enjoy benefits intended for all. He wrote a concurring opinion on June's astonishing decision that permitted high school football coach to commandeer the 50-yard line after games for his personal prayers over the public uh, school district's objection. Let's go ahead and halt there for a minute to talk about that particular bit of info. I don't remember if we did a topic on that. We might have, but I, I could be wrong. But the basic idea is that there were students who were going to get discriminated against for not praying on those lines because it would make them stick out like a sore thumb. In, I believe it was in Texas, where the majority of people are Christian anyway. So doing, like, signaling that you're not a Christian to all of your peers is a death knell for you. And Alito is like, no, no, this is fine. This is fine. Discriminating against them is fine. Creating an environment where religion cannot enter into the conversation where school is concerned is the way that we need to go, because not everybody shares the same religion. And making people basically publicly show what religion they have when they're in a school, an environment where none of that belongs. That's the angle we should be going for, because that's the angle that benefits a religious people and religious people alike. If you're a Christian, but you happen to be a Mormon, it benefits you more not to out yourself to everybody around you if that would affect your social standing. If you're a-religious, it benefits you as well. The only person whom it benefits to be forced to out yourself, or at least have a teacher be allowed to out you to everybody else around you, the only people who that benefits are people who are already in the majority. And we should be making any laws to benefit everyone, not just people who happen to be in the majority, especially when it comes to religion. I don't want to have to be the person that has to make a video because some Jewish kid gets discriminated against because he's not going to pray on the sidelines with everybody else because the coach is leading a Christian prayer. I, I don't think I need to explain how just insane that scenario is, but it's a scenario that's enabled by Alito's position now. So a coach that's Norse pagan can just force the team to uh, to go out and pray. The thing is, is that he is not forcing them. That's the that's the reason that this was able to go through the way it did. The coach was not forcing anybody to pray. The problem is, is that by being a person who is a leader of this team, initiating a pr a religious prayer specifically with all the kids involved. It's a call to action, one that if you ignore, will single you out. That's why. That's what creates a dangerous environment for kids. Having an a-religious, a-political environment where we can have it, where kids are concerned, is what we should be aiming for. But people try to say that being LGBTQ is political, and then that gets taken out of, uh, of education. We have people trying to say that race is political, when it shouldn't be, it's just what you are and even then it's constructed socially and then religion which shouldn't enter into public education at all because not everybody shares a religion gets thrown in he was a vigorous dissenter during the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic 
when the court upheld the attendance limits that governments were placing on religious as well as secular gatherings. And later on, when the court reversed itself on that issue after Justice Amy Coney Barrett's arrival, he was part of the five-member majority that established a new, most favored nation status for religion. Meaning that any time the government, for whatever reason, grants a secular entity an exemption from a restriction or regulation, the failure to offer religion as a, uh, a similar exemption is presumptively unconstitutional. So, in common speak, all that is, is if we grant an exemption for gathering to, say, a Walmart or a Target or a place where people have to go for groceries, we then take religious organizations, places that people elect to go because they choose to, we give them the same protections when they serve different functions. It's a category error, but it's a category error that's easy to make if you view both as equally important. I don't. You can have a religious ceremony with as many participants as you want utilizing current technology like Zoom. And yes, the same thing can be said for shopping, but shopping is cheaper and easier if you are doing it on your own versus doing it online, having something like Instacart take care of it. Whereas having a group meeting for your church is actually cheaper for you doing it online. I'm not going to make a decision that disparages people who don't have a lot of money to spend in the first place. So that naturally leads me to the position of your church service can be held online and you can go shop at the grocery store if you need. Now, there is something to be said about how that makes it very hard and sometimes even impossible to contain a deadly virus, but that is its own conversation. Said, so yes, we all know that. But Justice Alito's Notre Dame speech still merits close examination for what it reveals about the assumptions built into his worldview. What does it mean, for example, to assert that it is people who are not religious who need to be persuaded that religion is worthy of special treatment? Do all religiously observant people naturally believe that religion merits more protection than other values? There is scant evidence for that, in any event, that it has not been our law, at least not until recently. Still on the books is a 1990 decision, Employment Division v. Smith, which provides that the Constitution's Free Exercise Clause offers no special exemption from a neutral law that is generally applicable. That decision's author was Justice Antonin Scalia, one of the more overtly religious people to sit on the Supreme Court in modern times. Alito followed his observation with a scornful appraisal of law professors, presumably exempting the many in attendance at his speech. A dominant view among legal academics, he said, was that society should treat religion just like any other passionate personal attachment, say rooting for a favorite sports team or pursuing a hobby or following a popular artist or group. Continuing, he noted that law professors often pose hypothetical scenarios, and he poses one of his own. Suppose a court had a rule against attorneys wearing headgear. Attorney A, a rabid Green Bay Packers fan, insists on wearing a Packers green and gold head cap in the courtroom. Attorney B is an Orthodox Jew, who wears a skull cap. Attorney C is a Muslim woman in hijab, or any other head covering. If A can't wear his Packers hat, is it still possible to accommodate B and C? Well, for me, the Constitution of the United States provides a clear answer. Some of my colleagues are not so sure, but for me, the text tells the story. The Constitution protects the free exercise of religion. It does not protect the free exercise and support of Packers. So, I want to agree with this statement. I, I really do. Because it can be just as problematic if you happen to be in a highly religious household to go somewhere that will force you to do something that is not in line with your religion. Sure, why not? But at the same time, I have to ask you, are these even equatable? When we are talking about treating exercise of religion the same way that somebody treats, say, oh, I don't know, a sports team. We're talking about matters of necessity. Said so no Packers, but I get to score you without mine. <sighs> different, different Packer stuff. Different Packer stuff. Like, I want to agree with this. But at the same time, I can't. Because the problem with this logic is that all religions of any kind, 
merit the exact same importance for our society. I don't necessarily believe that's the case, especially when shit like Heaven's Gate exists. I, I, I don't. Again, a religious ceremony can be held with equal efficacy online. A music event can be held with efficacy online. Viewing people going to a church outside of staying in their cars or outside of being in the middle of, uh, of a Zoom meeting, viewing that in a vacuum would lead you to the decision that they should be allowed free exercise in any case whatsoever. The problem is, is that the world doesn't exist in a vacuum. We don't have the ability to analyze this through the vacuum of if religious good, if not religious, who care. We have to look at it through the, uh, through the situation in which it occurred. This occurred during the height of COVID. So what you're telling me is that two things. One, it is more important for people to exercise their religion than it is for us to view the health of our population in total. And by health of our population, I mean in ways we can clearly measure. People getting packed together in the middle of a Greg Locke sermon ends up being a super spreader event. And I'm sorry if that seems to be an issue, but the reality is packing a bunch of people together in a church does not help you when you're dealing with a virus. Whereas you're going to get the exact same sermon from the exact same person, and you'll be in a digital room with the exact same people utilizing something like Zoom. I say this as somebody whose grandmother literally does this over Zoom with her congregation. So I'm not saying this from the back of my throat like an idiot. I'm saying this from experience. So that even aside from his swipe at his fellow justices who haven't signed up for his crusade, to call this kind of talk simplistic is far too generous. Again, without even reading that part, my position was that if you're viewing this in a vacuum, it's very simple and clear cut, but you can't. Justices and legal scholars alike have struggled for decades to identify the right balance for religion within a pluralistic society, an effort Justice Alito reduced to a cartoonish either or. Even were I willing to cut him some slack or lose uh, uh, for loose talking among friends, I don't know whether he was aware that Notre Dame would post the video online, I would still find the narrowness of his vision deeply disturbing. He offered no acknowledgement, none, of the harm that can occur when religion is elevated above all other claims to recognition and respect. For example, in the aftermath of his, op of his opinion in the 2014 Hobby Lobby case, tens of thousands of women have never received the contraceptive coverage to which the Affordable Care Act entitled them because they work for employers with objections to particular forms of birth control. His opinion in 2020, extending the so-called minstrel exception to cover non-minstrel employees of religious organizations, stripped those employees of protection of federal laws that prohibit job discrimination. And of course, the very opinion he bragged about to his audience in Rome, and opinions that I have recently explained was grounded on the religious doctrine rather than constitutional law, took no account of its devastating impact on women. Again, we have a repeat of the problem of viewing these things through a vacuum as opposed to viewing them within the material conditions in which they happen. I would like us to have a more materialistic and more pluralistic society, a society where people who are religious and people who are a-religious can both accept that they have to exist within the same geographical bounds, and we need to make accommodations for all of us, but also for us to accept that because not everybody who is religious can agree on the existence of other deities, then we need to just maintain a materialistic approach to everything. And yeah, that technically does favor people who are atheists more, but that ends up being more circumstantial than anything. Operating within the material world just means that we're offer operating within the world of things we can see, measure, and have results. At least when it comes to trying to operate decision-making, laws. Ideally, also when it comes to employment opportunities. For those who don't know, when I was working at McDonald's, I literally got written up 
on the basis that God told an employee I did something wrong. And that was viewed at my job in the American South as enough to merit a write-up. God told an employee I did something wrong. That employee reported the thing God told them to a manager. A manager who was on the same pay grade as me. That pay grade got special permission from a manager higher than us to authorize going through with my write-up. And then when I tried to confront the employee who said that I did wrong things, they said that Jesus told them to. And so I had no authority on the matter. Since that is my experience, a thing that I have had to deal with here, I'm just going to say, just the long and short of it is, we should view most pluralistic decisions through a lens of materialism because elsewise scenarios like that crop up all the time. Uh, Cult of Winter. Thank you very much for the follow. In speeches as well as opinions, Alito has warned of a growing hostility to religion. And he did the same in Rome, denouncing what he calls hostility to at least the traditional religious beliefs that are contrary to the new moral code that is ascendant in some sectors. This was the Alito of his uh, this was the Alito of his opinion dissenting from the Obergfell versus Hodges decision, which recognized a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. He predicted then that those who cling to old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes, but if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such. Y y yes, that's a feature, not a bug, Alito. Yes. If you say that gay people shouldn't marry and you say it within the con within the confines of your own home, nobody cares. The minute you start saying that out in public with people who might be gay having to listen to the shit that you say, guess what? Suddenly people care. Wow, it's it's almost like this is basically how a society works. That's that's how this shit works. You can say whatever the fuck you want to the privacy of your own home. But the minute you go out in public, you have to make some accommodations for the other people in public. Holy shit. What a weird thing for a Supreme Court justice not to have the basic understanding of. That's just weird. In Rome, more clearly than in the past, Alito provided his own definitions of religious liberty. An expansive definition that mirrored the court's holdings in this summer, praying coach case. In that case, the school district of Bremerton, Wash, had offered the coach an alternative place where he could pray after the games. But the coach insisted that he felt religiously compelled to pray in public in full view of the spectator stands. The court, which in the past was notably stingy when it came to the free speech rights of public employees, endorsed this expression of militant Christianity. In his Rome speech, Justice Alito did not refer explicitly to that case, but his definition of religious liberty underscored and explained the court's remarkable departure. Religious liberty must mean more than simply freedom of worship. Freedom of worship means freedom to do these things that you like to do in the privacy of your own home or in your church or your synagogue or your mosque or your temple. But when you step outside of the public square in the light of day, you had better behave yourself like a good secular citizen. And he said, that's the problem we face. If that is a problem, it's one that Justice Alito has solved for himself. His religion does not reside in the quiet recesses of his home or chambers. His is religion on the march. And that's the problem the rest of us face now. And that's the end of the article there. So this is where we can come to a few conclusions here. Uh, John Head 12, thank you for the follow. The first one we can talk about is the fact that nobody should limit your practice of religion out you know, in, in your church, in your synagogue, or wherever you happen to be, as long as it doesn't infringe on the rights of others. But when he talks about things like the Obergfell uh, case, what he ends up talking about is where religion ne uh, necessarily has to encroach on other people and their beliefs and their lives. I would love to live in a purely pluralistic world where everybody recognizes that we have different beliefs, but we don't let that extend to trying to harm and control each other. 
where the only things that we try to stop are the things that are expressly harmful to the other people around us. That's not the world Alito wants to have. He wants to have a world where a specific subsect of American society has the power to make those controlling decisions for other people. Gay people being able to get married is offensive to some Christians, so gay people shouldn't be able to be married at all. Their religion gets to supersede the lives and livelihood of other people. That is not a good world to live in, because again, it's a world that is completely hinging on you maintaining your own majority religion, specifically that. Building a world where our legal accommodations are materialistic and our legal accommodations do not extend past the post for religion creates a world where everybody gets to experience their religion, do what they need to do with their religion, and live their religion without harming people who are a-religious or do not share their religion. But that's not the world that Alito wants to make. He wants to make a world where, in his opinion... Christianity gets to write those rules. He has shown so in his Supreme Court decisions on that he's done, and he has shown so when he goes and talks with others about this issue. I hope that we don't lose gay marriage in the United States. And if we do, I I foresee violence happening. <sighs> Anyways, let me know what y'all think. In the, in the comment section below, there's a lot of shit to discuss when it comes to what the Supreme Court is doing lately. And I'm fully of the opinion that the Supreme Court is currently a very, very ideologically motivated body, as opposed to being merely the interpreters they are supposed to be. But let me know what you think in the comment section below. As always, everyone, insert end of video tagline here. <laughs>